afternoon and welcome to Moments with Melinda. My name is Melinda Molson and I'm your host. And I am just want you to know that I am channeling right now the great Jan Reynolds, who happens to be my guest today. Hi, Jan. How are you? I am fine. I'm excited to talk with you, Melinda. And I'm channeling you, you with these sunglasses because, <laughs> because I'm going to tell my viewers all about you. For any of you out there who don't know Jan Reynolds, Jan Reynolds is a seventh generation Vermonter, international explorer, world record setting climber and skier, and award winning nonfiction author working in extreme environments. I mean, and a mom, and a mom, and a mom, of course. Probably my most important job. That, that is, I'm sorry, I forgot that. You're absolutely right. You are the mother <laughs> to two pretty remarkable sons. So, um, Jan, we're going to get right to it right here because I have a lot to cover with you uh, for this show today. I'm going to start my timer. Um, and first off, I want to ask you to share with my viewers, since you're a seventh generation Vermonter, share with my viewers about growing up in Vermont. Growing up in Vermont. Well, I think it sets a very strong foundation for life. I think Vermonters in general, at least, you know, I come from a big farm family. There's seven kids, came from Middlebury, lived on a dairy farm. Um, my dad and hired men were milking a little over 100 cows, so it wasn't too big of a farm, but my dad owned other farms too. And so we rode around in trucks and in the cornfields and uh, played in the apple trees. And um, so the basic Vermont at that time, I think... Vermonters have a sense of humility, a sense of uh, if it breaks, you can fix it, a sense of being understated, um, a sense of being very capable, yet understated. And I think that sort of Vermont background has uh, stuck with me. And I think when I travel and I work overseas and when I work with indigenous people in my book series, Vanishing Cultures, I think that Vermont background where I grew up living close to the land and the animals, it's probably part of what drives draws me way out there with other people that are living very close to the land and the animals. It feels somewhat like home to me. And these people are very capable, they're very practical, they're very understated, they're generous, um, they're hardy. If it breaks, they can fix it or they'll figure something out. And I think that's Vermont that I carry with me with all my work. So tell me, tell me, tell, tell my viewers a little bit about, about your life growing up. You were, you were one of, I believe, seven or eight children and you were- yeah. The youngest. number six of seven. Yeah, we're number six of seven. So the, yeah. the second youngest. Talk yeah. a, talk a little bit about about your family and growing up on a farm and and your seventh generation, which means you go back to the. Well, seventh. there's a woman named Ann Story, and she's buried in our family um, graveyard down in Middlebury, and she was the original single mom, and. Back in history, our ancestors were in Connecticut, they were bound out. And what that means, it's kind of like the closest you could get to slavery. You belong to someone um, and you had to work their farms. But both the French king and the English king gave away the same land up north, which is now Vermont. So if you were bound out, if you left and went north and you cleared land, then you would own it. And that was how both the French and the English kings expanded their territory. But that's that's part of why there was there were problems in the north between the Indians and the French coming down and trying to burn out the settlers because the French king said it belonged to them and the English king and those settlers said it belonged to them and blah, blah, blah. But sort of the whole the whole thing of being on the farm and uh when you were mentioning seventh generation, seventh or eighth generation. That's where that comes from, just the stories about Anne's story and her being an early settler. Wasn't and, her family Hannah Reynolds, the Hannah, Hannah Reynolds family? Yeah. Yeah. yeah but I don't know a whole so, lot about that. So or there's the a good chance you come from that lineage and it goes back that far to the mid-1700s. Yes. That's, yes. That's, 
So you and you so are, that same land, the farm, you know, life on the farm. Uh, it's the same area where she's been, and I grew up there. So it's been there for you know we've been there for generations. So so you are you are a tall, strong Vermont red oak, my friend. Um, let's talk about the life that most of us can only dream about. Um, share with us some of your most exciting moments, as you have said, of getting truly lost on this planet oh the most it's, it's it's pretty hard when people ask superlatives you know what's exciting for me might not be exciting for someone else well, it doesn't but... matter you just tell us this i just wanted you to share with my viewers some of the exciting things that you've done in your life from hanging off the side of mount everest to going off to exotic places that none of us would ever well, even know living about. in caves being without food for five days trying to find our way to civilization in the himalaya I crossed over into Tibet on skis and the Chinese army was there chasing me and they, but they just had their little canvas army boots and pistols. And I was on the biathlon team and I knew the range of a rifle. And I, it's kind of funny. I mean, on skis, there's no way they're going to catch me. They're trying to run along and the range of a pistol is nothing like a, a rifle, but it, it was very sad and scary. There have been people who the Chinese army have captured up there and shot. So, you know, it was very real, um, you know, things like that. Uh, we, I took we, a hot air balloon over Everest. We crashed, we rolled, we caught on fire. I managed to put it out so we didn't blow with the gas tanks hanging right there. Um, you know, stuff like that. You have done, and, and you, have, you have done extraordinary, um, you have had a life full of extraordinary uh, experiences. So what do you think? And you, you said it a little bit in the opening of our discussion, but what do you think gave you this grit and the confidence and also the skill to be what you are known as uh, quite comfortably, I hope, as a world explorer? Um, so I'd go back to background again, you know, that I'm in order to play with the bigger kids on the farm, you know, I had to keep up. I think that had something to do with it um and living with living simply with just hand-me-downs and all of those kinds of things I think it set me up for um being able to get along go with the flow um I think uh when I was younger we didn't have sports for women until we got into high school but I was a big uh, Nordic cross-country ski racer and made the junior national team. And I think training, when I first became a teen, uh, training hard and working out physically gave me the physical strength and the endurance and, and, and maybe the grit to, I mean, the sport of Nordic skiing uh, does a lot for you uh, in terms of endurance and you never really know how you're doing until you finish. So conditions could be all awful and you think you're not doing well but it's maybe awful for everybody else and the next thing you know you won if you just keep hanging in there so uh i think vermont and farm life and being a nationally ranked cross-country skier and training for that set me up for the kind of strength and attitude i might need and then the skills well that's what you you develop and I just happened to be drawn to the outdoors and I went to school for a year my second year at the University of Vermont I went to school in Norway because I was a big Nordic skier and I raced over there and I learned the language and I began ice climbing over there and um, I joined a winter rescue squad and we would dig snow holes when we were searching for people and we'd live outside um, and, you know, I, I developed the skills you, you need for being out, but also taking care of someone else at, on being on a rescue squad. So I think all of those things kind of set me up for being an expedition person. Um, so it's a sort of background and then sort of personal choices. And then I, while I was young as a teen, I had photos exhibited in the Boston Center for the Arts, black and whites that I had done and developed, and I had a short story published. So I was already involved in uh, writing and photography. So 
combining that with my outdoor skills and, you know, strength and endurance made me a pretty good package to go on an expedition and then be able to photograph and write about it so that you could bring something back for sponsors and magazines so that you're funded. Right. So I, I didn't set it up in my head to have all of those pieces, but they sort of came naturally. I fell together. Now, yeah. now, Jan, you were a member of the Explorers Club in New York City, and you were being inducted into the United States Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame in March. You've received numerous awards and been hailed as one of the most amazing and interesting women in the world. And yet, you were one of the most understated and humble people that <laughs> I know. So how do you balance your fame with your humility and your, and your humanity? Well, I, I don't have that much fame. <laughs> <laughs> you do. No, I'm so sorry. there's not a lot to balance. No, but you do. You, I mean, what what you've accomplished and 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 done. Well, thanks, like Melinda, I mean, really, to, you to know, be a member of the ski of the Explorers Club, and and also to to this year to be inducted into the Ski Hall of Fame, the United States Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame, and that's a big deal. And you've received numerous awards and recognition over your lifetime. So, and you balance that so well. I mean, I know you quite well as a friend and you are an understated and you have a lot of humanity. And I'm just wondering for my viewers, how do you balance that all? Oh, how do I balance that all? Um, well, a couple of things, M maybe, cause someone else said this to me too, that really, especially outside of Vermont, you know, people don't know who, who I am or what are, what I do or what my work is. Hopefully they appreciate my books, the kids and librarians that pick them up. Um, and they are still in print 30 We're years later. Right so, my, so my work, my yeah. work is working and that's, what's, uh, important to me. Um, but me personally, I think Melinda, if I had been a man who things have changed now and women are doing everything and getting lots of attention for it as they should. Um, but I think if I had been a man doing all the different things that I've done, the U.S. biathlon team, setting world records, award-winning books, you know, it would have been a bigger deal. But, you know, as a female, I think you just kind of fall through the cracks. Well, here, here, because you're, you're not, you're, you're a little, you're several years, quite a bit, few years than I am, but you're in your 60s. Yeah, 67. I don't mind giving yeah, you know, I don't, and I'm 72, but I, but you look like, I mean, you're very youthful looking, um, very, very youthful looking. And, and, um, and so, um, anyway, I get that whole thing about being a woman. So thank you for that. But I, I love the fact that you are so understated and you have such humanity and humility and you have one of the, you have such a great sense of humor. I'm going to move right now into your Children's but story. I'm going to jump back in. Melinda, you are the same. You are the same. And I was so excited when that article came out about you that I read, because it's the same thing. You're very competent. You do your work. You get it done. If you had been a man, you probably would have been touted over and over again, or there would have been more money thrown oh, at you for more absolutely. projects. Same thing for me. I ended up soloing a lot of things because in my time, the money and response and and leadership wasn't going to go to a woman, and the men were not going to go with me. Well, no, I'm fine. <laughs> so I soloed over the Himalaya. You know, you just do your I thing. Soloed National Geographic funded you to do to solo. Uh, yeah, across the Himalayas. I mean, yeah. that's extraordinary. Um, and I and I totally agree with you. And that that's something we need to talk about over dinner because I that's it's a comfort for you. Well, to it's just you were you were admiring or saying very kindly to me. Wow, you 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 handle doing lots, and you still seem like a regular person. Is what I think you were Maybe saying. Women like, do. Well, Melinda, you know that answer. That's you. Well, we'll have to have a con off, We'll have to have an off TV <laughs> discussion about that. I want you to take us right now to your extraordinary uh, Vanishing Cultures book series. And you you have published now, I think, over 20 books. And talk to us about this project that you've been doing for probably many years and uh, writing your children's book called the Vanishing Cultures book series. Share that with my viewers. Well, um, I actually had a problem with my back and I couldn't walk for a couple of months. 
And that was back in the time of, of phones that were, you know, um, uh, attached to the wall. What do you call them? Uh, you know, just a, a regular landlines or call landline. So regular landline phone and the phone would ring. And the only way I could answer it was to roll off the couch and go on my hands and knees and answer the phone. So my back really, it didn't work. It didn't function. And I had done, I'd set a lot of records and all of this, but I had two months to really literally lay on the couch and think about it, that if my body got put back together, what would I do? What's important? And during that time, that's how I came up with the Vanishing Cultures series. And for me, I figured, oh, there's always going to be people to set records. And that was that was so in, invigorating and exciting when I did it. But what meant more to me were these people that I met in the nooks and crannies of planet Earth. They were lovely. And they were vanishing. They were disappearing fast, their way of life. And I knew if I was put back together because I scuba dive, I skydive, I ice climb, I ski, I can bike, I can hike, I can get into about anywhere. So I decided I wanted to do something to give these indigenous people around the world that I had met in the nooks and crannies a voice. And I wanted to photograph their way of life before we couldn't do it anymore. Now, if someone wanted to follow my footsteps and went back to all the places I went to, they would not be able to get the photographs I've gotten. It, it, it was changing that fast. And I lived with an indigenous tribe on each continent, photographed them, wrote about them, Tibetans in the Himalaya, the Tuareg in the Sahara, which is the matrilineal society, the men wear veils, not the women. And they ran the salt caravans across the Sahara. Um, the, the Samis in the far north, the reindeer herders, the aboriginals in Australia, um, the Inuit for North America that were still building igloos and hunting, and um, the Anamama in the Amazon territory, which was hundreds of miles out. It took me two months to get permission to even get in there. Um, and uh, Mongolia. So um, that's how that was born uh, out of having a, I, I almost wish for everyone not to have something go wrong with their body, but give them time somewhere in their life, a couple of months, like if I could do anything, what would it be? And then go for it. I remember my friend driving me to New York City and I ended up with back surgery and I ended up being okay. And I couldn't even sit down. So I laid flat and I would go into publishing houses and they'd say, oh, have a seat. You know, you know, we'd like to see your photographs. What, you know, what are you, what are you proposing here? And I go, no, 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 no. I've been, you know, driving in, I'd rather not sit down. I, I didn't dare tell them. I said, I'm, you know, I'm going to the Himalaya, I'm going to the Sahara, and I couldn't even freaking sit down. Oh, right. God. So who's going to give me a whole bunch of some money in advance, you know, when advance I, on royalties when I can't even sit down? So well, then, that, well, that was hilarious, you know. Well, now, Jan, you just got back. I, I saw you right before you left in November. Tell us about your most recent trip that you took in November and the book that you are writing about and that experience. Um, I spent some time with the Bajau and I've always wanted to visit these people. Um, there are a couple of things that I would like to get across in this book. And one is that um, with the Bajau, they can see underwater in a way we can't, and they can stay underwater for almost 15 minutes. And they have lived on boats for many generations and they hunt underwater. So their bodies have literally adapted. So it's a way to show children that this human form we have isn't our final form. If you look at the Bajau, you can see how we genetically adapt. And um, so, and then the other thing, um, I, I, I like the idea of showing again that we're all one human family, you know. Well, how did their bodies adapt? Explain that to us. Well, then if you're a geneticist, you understand it's kind of like um, any genetics. Let's see, how would they I grow, explain Did their it? lungs get bigger? Did they, because they lived underwater? And could I think a lot of it is, um, um, it's one way I can describe it is 
if you go to Tibet, the Tibetans and the Sherpas can breathe up higher, better than we can, because genetically their bodies have been adapting for thousands of years. So that's a better way to explain it. So just with the Bajau, they have been adapting to being underwater. So they're, you know, all the, you need a scientist for that. But, but yes, <laughs> genetically, we adapt to our environment like all animals do. So did you did you go underwater and oh yeah well I I um which is good to keep learning new things I was scuba diving I had to redo my scuba certification and got my underwater camera and so I was underwater doing some photographs um with my scuba gear while they were underwater hunting did you um and you lived with them what so and and you can tell us where this where this was that you went i was on the togian islands and they are uh, you know indonesia is made up of they say 17000 islands so it took me 4 days to get all the way out to the togian islands and i found some of the bajau they really are living on their boats but what they'll do is make like a sort of a permanent boat it's like a house on the over the water and the boat can go under and um they're you pretty didn't speak cool. their language you you didn't speak their language so how did you communicate oh well that's that's not a problem hand gestures whatever hand i've gestures. been doing that forever yeah and well, i largely spend a lot of time with the kids i mean i i suppose you don't want to do screen share and if i had it set up i could give you show you a couple pictures of of them but uh well we're, well, we're getting we're getting towards the end of our thing but but, uh, but what i'd like you to do is tell us what the name of the book is and when it's going to come out and um and i have a feeling that you're probably going to have uh i'm going to tell folks that uh, your website is jan reynolds.com it's quite yeah simple. all my books are there jan your reynolds there, but your new book when is your new book coming out well, we don't know. I am putting it together now, and we don't know what the title will finally be. And I will be talking with um, different publishers in New York. Simon & Schuster's expressed some interest. But I'm also putting up free books on my YouTube channels. Just go to YouTube, go to Jan Reynolds. And um, I have one book called Loving Kindness about um, a young tulku. He's a reincarnated uh, Lama, just like the Dalai Lama. And I have a book about his life, learning about compassion and loving kindness. So um, I'm working a lot of different ways. So I'll probably have some of my Indonesian work up on my YouTube channel uh, under Jan Reynolds, at Jan Reynolds. And um, if Simon & Schuster picks it up, then my Indian, my Bajau book. Right now, the working title is Bajau book. How exciting. Okay. How exciting, Jan. Um, and you and you and um, so I want to talk to you a little bit about. We talked about the Anne story from the Revolutionary period about this woman who lived in Middlebury and her husband and son were. Her husband was killed, and she had to. Right. She uh, had her home burned and lived in a cave, and then she created, rebuilt her house, and then had a tunnel where uh, the the Patriots could, could the Green Mountain could, Boys. She Green worked Mountain with the Green Mountain Boys, yeah. Could, could flee. And that's down in that area where a lot of the Green Mountain right. Boy, and I don't know if you Rick and I are kicking off this film on Ethan Allen. So we're going to want to talk to you more about oh, that. Oh yeah, we I'm cool. gonna want to chat with so you. So no wonder you must know a lot about I don't that. well we're just kicking this off, but we have 20 historians and we're gonna to want to talk to you. But Anne's story, so do you do you think that and this Anne's story is quite famous. Do you but her name was Hannah Reynolds. Do you believe that you could be a, you probably are a, a, a descendant of her. Uh, my my dad always said we were. And like well, I said, I she's were. buried in our family graveyard. There in you Middlebury. go. So she's nearby, no matter what. She's, she's nearby. An inspiration. And yeah, uh, she ended up, be, she was a single mom with her kids way up in Vermont. When there was no road, you had to walk over a trail. I guess there was a road to Rutland. And after that, you had to walk, but she had a horse to put the packs on. She went up with her kids. Her husband was killed clearing the land, but she went up anyway. Fantastic story. Well, yeah, it, it is have, kind that, of. That'll have to be another interview, but people can can Google Anne Story Vermont. And, yeah. Uh, and I have no doubt you're you're a descendant of, of Anne's stories. So uh, another question I have is what you have done in your life has so often been on the edge of a cliff. You push yourself to do things that would defeat 
pretty much most any human being, certainly me, but most human beings. <laughs> so again, I'm going to go back to this because I think it's unique to you and people like you. And there are women in our world who have that, but they don't get heard and you don't hear about them. And, and I don't know if there's as many as men, but where do you get the resolve to put and take yourself over the edge of what is humanly possible? Oh, I don't know if it's over the edge of what's humanly possible. Well, but well it, talk to me about you, you camping on the side of, of Everest, that, that incredible book that you wrote about your, your, um, your exploring Everest Mount Grand Everest. Circle. You know, it's, it's, it's the name of the, again, again, the name is of your book is Everest Grand Circle, but it's in the more Circle. current book. It's called, um, uh, it's called the glass summit, the glass mm -hmm. summit. And I just got, a, I just got a copy and I was reading it and I got to the, the poor, the part where you, you literally are camping out on the side of the mountain and sleeping in like a, you lost me for a minute. I'm in my office. This one and like it's all here, yeah. last summit. It's got that story. It got translated into Italian. That's outstanding. It's Italian now. But I mean, that's life and death stuff, Jan. And, and, and you, and you've done it over and over again. And I'm just, I mean, maybe, maybe there is no answer for this, except it is who you are, but yeah, but I but, think, I think the reality, you know what I think the answer is, you know, call it bizarre, but for me, it's, fun at the time i was doing it it was the most fun thing i could think of to do on planet earth these guys that i was hanging out with that we would go and climb and it's 30 below zero and that lenticular cloud is over everest and it's coming your way and you better hunker down and rappel off or you're going to get blown off and it's just that connection with your climbing buddies Your mortality and, and picking a, a a goal and doing it i there was nothing there was nothing in the world at that point in time that i thought was more fun That's call it strange or bizarre but to me and for those that like that kind of thing there wasn't any other place i'd rather be I even when we ran out of food it's still it's so remarkable because you are so alive. It's not a death wish. You're so alive. Every moment counts. Every thought, every decision, your connection with your teammates, it makes life so big and real and immediate. You like know, your life is big and strong and immediate. I absolutely, I, I am, I'm just, I'm always in awe with you, but I, enough of my, I just, oh, I just adore you so much. But I'm Listen, older and more mellow, Melinda. Come on, are, come on. I was just and, scuba diving with the Bajau. I'm taking it but easy. You're also, but, but you're also a lecturer and you are very generous with your time and you speak to students and in communities and share your experiences. So Jan, what do you have to say to children today that are growing up in a world where their climate is heating and they're faced with one of our species' greatest th threats? I think I would say that inside every one of you kids, there are skills and ideas that you have that we need. And the most important thing is to dig deep and find out what it is that you have to serve, to give, to offer. Even if you're a poet, you know, how's that going to help? Well, your words are, look at um, Amanda Gorman, okay? Poet. So, so your, your special gifts, your job is to find what that gift is and then give it, you know, and nobody knows what it is, but you, and no one can tell you what you should be doing. Only, you know, it's a big job to find that. It's a it big is. job. It is. And I, and I think you found it. And so, so now we're coming to the close and I, there's, a, and I want you to, Jan, you see the world in a way that most of us can only dream about. Um, and you see the big picture because you're out there in the world in places that none of us even know exist. So what is your vision for the next 20 years? And what are your hopes for humankind? Live simply, consume less, share more. Say that again. Say that again. Live simply consume less, share more. If we could all do that, 
I mean, I almost feel teary. I, I wish we could all do that. You know, I do too. And um, that's so it's beautiful. And so you have great hope for the future of our species. Yes? No? I'd rather be positive than negative. Good for I, you. You know? Well, Jan Reynolds, thank you for your time. Thank you for your friendship. Thank you for being a seventh generation Vermonter and for sticking <laughs> around, for sticking around and for giving us the next generation and your two beautiful sons. And um, I honor you and thank you for being on my show. And to my viewers... I want to thank you for joining me and Jan Reynolds for this half hour, and I will see you soon. Have a good day. Bye-bye. <laughs>